This is Omnia. This is a shorter version of the longer presentation that I did of this seminar. This seminar is a presentation of a document that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was given by the scholars the name Great Psalm Scroll. I will be presenting in this seminar a general overview of the Great Psalm Scroll and its relationship to the Book of Psalms, as well as providing evidence that the Great Psalm Scroll is in fact the original version of the Book of Psalms, the original Davidic Psalter and that the current version of the Book of Psalms in everyone's Bibles is a highly reworked and abbreviated rendition of the true Davidic Psalter, this reworked version in our Bibles being made by scribes who wanted to have a version of the Book of the Psalms which was more relevant for synagogue worship and which was more compatible with the lunar calendar that the Pharisees followed. The Great Psalm Scroll, like the Temple Scroll, was found in the 11th cave of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1956 and it was one of the longest and best preserved scrolls that was found amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. Unfortunately, the scroll is not fully preserved. The beginning is missing. However, we are very fortunate regarding the Great Psalm Scroll in regards to preserving the ending portions of the Book of Psalms. The Great Psalm Scroll preserves almost the entirety of the last one-third of the Book of Psalms, equivalent to approximately 49 Psalms of the original Book of Psalms. It is my contention that the Pharisees are responsible for corrupting the original book of Psalms by replacing it with their own special version, the very version that all Jews and Christians are familiar with today, the version of the book of Psalms that is in all Bibles. Because the book of Psalms was intended to be used liturgically in worship, it was frequently modified to fit the preferences of the congregations and synagogues for their worship services. Because the book of Psalms is not a book containing any narrative, it was subject to frequent modification for the purpose of different thematic focuses. However, when the scribes of the Pharisees wanted to fix the text of the scriptures, they worked to produce a standardized text which everyone would be forced to use. And for the book of Psalms, they ultimately succeeded. This standardization of the scriptures allowed them to have control not only of Israel's interpretation of the Law of Moses and Israel's interpretation of the Prophets, but also would allow them to have control over Israel's worship services and the liturgy of Israel's synagogues. In other words, the Pharisees wanted control over the entire religion of all of Israel. They wanted to impose their man-made traditions onto the people. What we see is that the Great Psalm School and the Dead Sea School is not only in opposition to the liturgical monopoly of the Pharisees over Israel's synagogue worship, but it is also in opposition to the oral laws of the Pharisees, and it is in opposition to the Pharisees' biblical canon of the prophets. The Great Psalm Scroll opposes the oral law of the Pharisees because the Great Psalm Scroll explicitly endorses the solar calendar as the one and only true calendar that is to be used for the observation of the holy festivals and Sabbaths. The Great Psalm Scroll also opposes the biblical canon of the prophets that the Pharisees had because the Great Psalm Scroll explicitly identifies many other writings of David as divinely inspired prophetic scripture. The Great Psalm Scroll also specifies how many songs and which songs of David are that are to be used for liturgical worship. And this specification contradicts the much narrower liturgical worship that the Pharisees established for themselves. So while it may seem that a different book of Psalms being the original version would not have major implications for our faith, in reality it would completely shatter and demolish the entirety of the oral tradition of the Pharisees, as well as prove the narrow biblical canon of the Pharisees to have no legitimacy. Before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, the Book of Psalms was preserved in two main versions, the Hebrew version of the Masoretic Text and the Greek version of the Septuagint. There are three key differences between the Hebrew version and the Septuagint Greek version. Firstly, the Septuagint version of the Book of Psalms divides the Psalms differently than the Hebrew version of the Book of Psalms does. For example, Psalms 9 and 10 of the Hebrew version are counted as only one Psalm in the Septuagint version. This makes Psalms 11 to 113 of the Hebrew version counted as Psalms 10 to 112 in the Septuagint version. Psalms 114 and 115 of the Hebrew version are also counted as only one Psalm in the Septuagint version. But Psalms 114 and 115 in the Septuagint version are counted as only one Psalm in the Hebrew version, making Psalms 117 to 146 in the Hebrew version counted as Psalms 116 to 145 in the Septuagint version. And the final difference in numbering of the Psalms is Psalms 146 and 147 in the Septuagint version counted as only one Psalm in the Hebrew version, thereby making Psalms 148 to 150 of the Hebrew version have the same count as Psalms 148 to 150 of the Septuagint version. The second key difference is that the Septuagint version has many extra words, extra phrases, and sometimes extra verses or extra sections that the Hebrew version of the Masoretic text does not have. 
A third key difference is that the Septuagint version also has one extra psalm that the Hebrew version of the Masoretic text does not have. This psalm is called Psalm 151. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, however, the third version was discovered. A third version was discovered, which has major implications for the original form of the Book of Psalms. This version that was discovered was found in more than one copy, but the best preserved copy was the Great Psalm Scroll. And this third version that was found also has three key differences between it and the Hebrew version of the Masoretic text and the Septuagint version. Firstly, the numbering of the Psalms was very different and went back and forth between the Septuagint and Masoretic numbering systems, effectively holding a middle position between the Septuagint and Masoretic versions for the numbering of the Psalms. Secondly, the third version has many extra words, extra phrases, extra verses, and extra sections which are not in the two other versions. Though it generally has the extra content the Septuagint version has, which this Masoretic version does not, indicating that the Masoretic is more corrupt and altered than the Septuagint version. And thirdly, the third version of the Book of Psalms, the one that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, has had approximately 14 extra psalms. The following is a brief description of the Book of Psalms as was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and how it compares to the Book of Psalms of the other two versions. For a much longer and exhaustive analysis, please listen to the longer presentation I did. The Masoretic version divides the entire Book of Psalms into five distinct sections. If anyone is unaware of this, all you have to do is look into most English translations of the Hebrew Book of Psalms. And you will see that there are five sections which are labeled as Book 1, Book 2, Book 3, Book 4, and Book 5. These labels are also in the Hebrew text that the English translations were translated from. Having five books is a clear parallel to the Law of Moses, which also has five books. Thus, this book of Psalms was intended to be understood as the foundational law of Israel's liturgy and worship. These five sections are labeled in the Masoretic version as follows. Book 1 is Psalms 1 to 41. Book 2 is Psalms 42 to 72. Book 3 is Psalms 73 to 89, Book 4 is Psalms 90 to 106, and Book 5 is Psalms 107 to 150. As can be seen when doing an in-depth and very thorough comparison of the three versions of the Book of Psalms, the main differences in the final book, the main differences occur in the final book, Book 5. However, each book, except Book 3, has important differences in arrangement in the Dead Sea Scrolls version. There are only two differences of arrangement in Book 1 of the Dead Sea Scrolls version of the Book of Psalms. Psalm 32 is missing, and Psalm 71 is found immediately after Psalm 38. There are also only two differences of arrangement in Book 2 in the Dead Sea Scrolls version. Psalm 71 is missing, and Psalm 32 is found immediately after Psalm 70. There are no differences of arrangement in Book 3 of the Dead sea, in the Dead Sea Scrolls version. In Book 4, Psalms 93, 104, and 105 are missing, and Psalms 113 to 117 are found immediately after Psalm 103. These are the only differences of arrangement in the Dead Sea Scrolls version for Book 4. So far, what is very amazing is that the first four books of the Book of Psalms, even with the differences in the Dead Sea Scrolls, are strikingly similar in numbering of the Psalms. And they both end in the same numbers in all four books. Thus, in both the Masoretic version and the Dead Sea Scrolls, Book 1 is to have 41 Psalms, beginning with Psalm 1 and ending with Psalm 41. In both the Masoretic version and the Dead Sea Scrolls version, Book 2 is to have 31 psalms, beginning with Psalm 42, and ending with Psalm 72. In Book 3, both the Masoretic Version and the Dead Sea Scrolls Version have 17 psalms, beginning with Psalm 73, and ending with Psalm 89. In Book 4, both the Masoretic Version and the Dead Sea Scrolls Version have 17 psalms, beginning with Psalm 90, and ending with Psalm 106. This is utterly amazing and simply cannot be a coincidence. There is a clear, intentional rearrangement going on a conscious effort to make the numbers fit mostly with the other version. But how can the changes that have occurred so far be explained? At least some of them can be explained somewhat. The following is a quotation from the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible translation of the Book of Psalms, whose translator says this, In 4Q Psalm A, Psalm 38 is followed by 71, and not by Psalm 39, as in the Masoretic text in the Septuagint. At first glance, this seems strange, but there is in fact a good explanation. Further study shows that there are only two psalms, Psalm 38 and Psalm 70, whose titles designate them for the memorial offering. It appears that Psalm 71 was meant to follow a psalm for the memorial offering. In the Masoretic text, this psalm is 70, while in 4Q Psalm A, it is 38. Both combinations are thus equally logical and valid. They make a very valid observation, and it makes sense what, what that scholar said. But how does one explain Psalm 32 being moved? 
Psalm 32 is the only psalm in Book 1 in the Masoretic Version which has the title Direction of. The majority of psalms which contain in its title Direction of are found in Book 2. Thus it would make sense for either the original version of Book 2 to have Psalm 32 in it, or for someone to move it into the second book for the sake of consistency and theme. Another amazing similarity in numbering that cannot be a coincidence is that if you were to begin the numbering of the psalms in the Book of Psalms with the second book instead, and to begin the first book after the end of the second book, it would make Psalm 30 to be Psalm 32, Psalm 71, the, uh, Psalm 31 in the Septuagint version. Thus, it would be one less than the Septuagint numbering, and it would make Psalm 69 be Psalm 71, Psalm 70 in the Septuagint version. Thus, it would also be one less than the Septuagint numbering here, too. So it is clear, due to the amazing similarity in numbers, that the arrangement was done very intelligently and with a specific numbering correspondence in mind. Now, moving on to the biggest book of the Book of Psalms, Book 5, the final book. This is the most unique book of the entire Book of Psalms and most radically different in the original version, the Great Psalm Scroll. In the Dead Sea Scrolls version, Book 5 is missing Psalms 113 to 117, and Psalms 93, 104, and 105 are found in their various places. It has also 14 extra Psalms. The first previously unknown... Um, the, the first extra psalm, that is, I, I believe should be called Memorial for Judah, or To Bless for Judah. In the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible English translation I referred to earlier, this new psalm is considered two distinct psalms, and they are named Eschatological Hymn and Apostrophe to Judah by the scholars. Looking at the spacing on the transcription, however, it is highly unlikely for them to be two different psalms, for if they were, the first one would have had to be extremely short, and it's unlikely it was that short. Comparing the differences of numerical arrangement of the Psalms in Book 5 in the Dead Sea Scrolls version with the numerical arrangement of the Psalms in the Masoretic version in the Septuagint version, there are some amazing similarities which simply cannot be coincidence. We also see many Psalms grouped together in inseparable blocks in both versions. Now, for Psalm 136, we see the presence of a small extra Psalm which is called by scholars the Cantina, in the Great Psalm Scroll, that is. The Cantina is clearly related to Psalm 136 and cannot be separated from it to another place in the book. The scribes, unable to remove this Cantina, simply removed it from the Book of Psalms entirely, seeing it was repetitive. Up until this point, the Book of Psalms is still very similar to our version. However, the remaining portions of the Book of Psalms in the Great Psalm School are extremely different than that of the Masoretic version. This is affected chiefly by the presence of most of the extra psalms in these final portions which are not in the Masoretic version or Septuagint version. In fact, if one were to remove these extra psalms, one would get the following order to the Masoretic numbering for the remaining psalms. Psalms 145, followed by 139, 137, 138, 93, 141, 133, 144, 142, 143, 149, and 150. Notice also that with the extra psalms removed, the final seven psalms of the Great Psalms Scroll are also all amongst the last ten psalms of the Masoretic Version, with the exception of Psalm 133. Also, what is significant is that with the exception of Psalm 93, excluding the extra psalms, the final twelve psalms of the Great Psalms Scroll are amongst the final eighteen psalms of the Masoretic Version. Of the extra psalms in which are not in the Masoretic version, but which are in the Great Psalm Scroll, three psalms which are found in a few copies of the Peshitta version of the Book of Psalms, which are numbered Psalms 152 to 154 in the Peshitta version, are also grouped together in the Great Psalm Scroll. In the Great Psalm Scroll, the psalm scholars call the Plea of Deliverance was also part of a group of Psalms 152 to 154. The Memorial for Zion, called by scholars the Apostrophe to Zion, immediately preceded Psalm 93. And immediately following the memorial, uh, excuse me, I mean, immediately preceding the memorial was some which was formerly known only in the book of the Apocrypha known as the Wisdom of Sirach. The song, which I call the Song of Wisdom, is equivalent to the book of Sirach, chapter 51, verses 13 to 30. This psalm, other than the final psalm, is one of the most important psalms in this entire book for reasons I shall explain in a little bit. Near the very end of the Great Psalm Scroll, immediately following Psalm 150, occurs the psalm which is known by scholars as the Hymn to the Creator. After that comes a psalm which is identical with 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1-7. to This song is the last song of 
is the last song of David that he ever wrote in his life, according to 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 7, and according to the Great Psalms. It would make sense for David's last song to be right near the end of the book of Psalms. Immediately following this is a psalm, or rather, more technically, a prose account of David's prophetic compositional accomplishments in his life. This is also fittingly put right near the end of the book of Psalms in the Great Psalms School. Psalm 140 seems also by implication to have been written near the very end of his life, since the Dead Sea Scrolls version includes it near the end of the book. So also Psalm 134, which is the final song of a sense, for that song is also included right near the end of the Great Psalm School. At the very last song of a sense, Psalm 134, which signifies its completion, would also be put as the third to last psalm in the Great Psalm Scroll, indicates that David finally gained victory and cl climbed fully the 15 steps of trial in his life. And finally, the very last two psalms in the entire book of Psalms significantly are the same as the very last psalm in the Septuagint version of the book of Psalms. It may very well be David's first two psalms that he ever wrote. And so with that said, book 5, instead of containing Psalms 107 to 150, as in the Masoretic version, 44 songs, psalms in all, the Dead Sea Scrolls version had book 5 contain Psalms 107 to 162, making the final book have 56 psalms instead of 44. The following I shall say is for the sake of highlighting the evidence that the Great Psalm School is indeed the original version and is thus scripture, as well as all the extra psalms in it. There are many peculiarities in the arrangement of the psalms between each version. I believe that these differences are better explained on the premise of the great psalm scroll being the original version. For example, perhaps the most convincing is that in regards to the 15 songs of ascent, Psalms 120 to 134, that is, the last two songs of ascent are not grouped together with the first 13 songs of ascent in the great psalm scroll, but they are grouped together in the Masoretic version. It is highly inconceivable that if the original had all the 15 songs of ascents together that a compiler and editor would take it upon himself to remove the last two songs of ascents and put them closer to the end of the book of Psalms. He would have had absolutely no motivation to do so. However, it is easy to see the motivation a compiler and editor would have to move the two songs of ascents, which were separated from the other 13, and group them with the first 13 songs of ascent. Secondly, one of the most convincing proofs is that one of the extra psalms in the Great Psalm Scroll is a composition which is found also in the last chapter of the Book of the Apocrypha known as the Wisdom of Sirach. Before the Dead Sea Scrolls had been found, many scholars had considered Sirach chapter 51 to not be originally the words of the man Joshua Sirach. In other words, either Joshua Sirach's grandson, who translated it into Greek for us, added that chapter to the wisdom of Sirach, or Joshua Sirach himself quoted in the last chapter several compositions from other writers. This theory of the scholars has now been confirmed in the Dead Sea Scrolls with the discovery of the Great Psalm Scroll. This version of the Wisdom Psalm in the Great Psalm Scroll is superior to the version in Sirach. This is evident because the version of the Great Psalm Scroll is more unabashedly erotic. This eroticism of the song was watered down in the version of the song found in Sirach. Thus, this song of wisdom in the Great Psalm Scroll has more archaic features than the version of the same song which was included in the Wisdom of Sirach. So what we have here is the Wisdom of Sirach quoting this Psalm of David as a chief inspired representation of wisdom. This means that Joshua Sirach, the author of the Wisdom of Sirach, or Sirach's grandson, the translator of Sirach into the Greek, believed that this Psalm was a divinely inspired testimony to the nature of wisdom. He thus proves that the Great Psalm Scroll is the original. How does Joshua Sirach prove it? Because since the wisdom of Sirach is scripture, and Joshua Sirach would not quote the Great Psalm Scroll in such a manner as he did unless he considered that psalm a true psalm of David, and thus the original version of the Book of Psalms. The wisdom of Sirach is also endorsed as scripture by virtually all the ancient church fathers, and was included in virtually all manuscripts of the Bible in Christian hands, and has been considered scripture by nearly all Christians from the from the 500s AD to modern time, with the exception of Protestants and a few insignificant persons, such as Jerome the Church Father. The apostles in their book, the Apostolic Constitutions, also quote from Sirach as authoritative scripture, and they included Sirach in the list of the books of the canon they gave for us that all believers are required to accept as a minimum for being established as a true assembly of God. Thus the wisdom of Sirach, with the premise that the wisdom of Sirach is scripture, 
proves that the Great Psalm Scroll is the original version of the Book of Psalms. Since the Wisdom of Sirach endorses this song as divinely inspired, inspired scripture, and the Great Psalm Scroll is clearly the source of this song that is in the last chapter of the Wisdom of Sirach. It is impossible to believe that the compiler responsible for the Great Psalm Scroll took the psalm from the Wisdom of Sirach, extracted it, and put it into a Davidic Psalter, which was intended to include only Davidic Psalms in it. There is nothing in this song in the Wisdom of Sirach that has marks of Davidic authorship, or to make one think that this psalm has anything to do with David. The fact that it is in the Great Psalm Scroll, which is a version of the Book of the Great, uh, uh, which is a version of the Book of Psalms, which is highly Davidic in character, more than our version of the Book of Psalms, essentially seals the, legitim the legitimacy of the Great Psalm Scroll as being the original. It is clear that Joshua Sirach had no concept of any Psalter being authoritative other than the Great Psalm Scroll. Another perhaps more convincing proof that this is the original version is that of the very last two psalms of the Great Psalm Scroll. This is because these two psalms correspond to the final psalm in the Septuagint version of the Book of Psalms, Psalm 151. The inclusion of Psalm 151 in the Septuagint version is significant for several reasons. First, both the Septuagint version and the Great Psalm Scroll end with Psalm 151. This is not a coincidence, but was clearly intentional. Secondly, the ascription to Psalm 151 in the Septuagint points to the Great Psalm Scroll being valid, for it says in the Septuagint version that this Psalm of Psalm 151 is outside the number of the Masoretic numbering, but that this Psalm is genuine and truly written by David. This title the Septuagint scribes gave to this final Psalm is clearly secondary, and it is evident that Psalm 151 was not originally in the Book of Psalms that they were translating, but that they extracted Psalm 151 from another version of the Book of Psalms which had it. Thus, the common version being circulated, which did not have Psalm 151, but only 150 Psalms, was supplemented with Psalm 151. We know it was supplemented from elsewhere because that the Septuagint says outside the number, and yet it is included in the number of the Septuagint Psalms. It is quite evident that the Septuagint is just endorsing the Great Psalm Scroll version as the true and original version. When we compare with Psalm 151, uh, when we compare Psalm 151 with the same psalm found in the Great Psalm Scroll, the Septuagint version is clearly secondary, as it can be seen how much the Greek version abbreviates the much fuller version that the Great Psalm Scroll has, so much so that in the Great Psalm Scroll, Psalm 151 is two separate and distinct psalms, whereas it is one shortened and combined psalm in the Septuagint version. It is highly unlikely to believe that the compiler of the Great Psalm Scroll took the much shorter and singular Psalm 151 of the Septuagint version lengthened it extensively, and separated it into two distinct psalms. It is much easier and more likely to explain Psalm 151 as being abbreviated and conflated into a single psalm by the translator of the, book, of the Masoretic Book of Psalms. Now consider, why would this be done? Translating books was very difficult in the ancient times, and because the Great Psalm Scroll was often radically different than our copies of the Book of Psalms, the copyists of the Greek manuscripts did not have the time or ability or scribal expertise to make a fresh translation of the entire Book of Psalms from the Great Psalm Scroll. Since translations of writings into other languages was a rare and difficult task to be successful in, a large amount of ancient literature, including divinely inspired scripture, ultimately had to be neglected and lost due to no one being competent or capable enough to translate all those writings into Greek or other languages the common people could understand. However, the scribal copyists did not want this knowledge of the original Book of Psalms to completely disappear. They had no realization that the Great Psalm Scroll would disappear completely. Uh, that is, the Septuagint scripts. Assuming that there would always be the Great Psalm Scroll in existence, they decided to include the final psalm of the Great Psalm Scroll in a short form as a testimony that although they did not have the Great Psalm Scroll translated into the Greek Septuagint, they believed that the Great Psalm Scroll was truly the original version. For if they did not believe such, they would not have said that that psalm is a genuine and authentic psalm by David. To include it at the very end of the Book of Psalms, in the exact same place the Great Psalm Scroll includes it, leads to the conclusion that the Septuagint version clearly endorses the Great Psalm Scroll as representative of the original version. Thus, without the Great Psalm Scroll, there would be no Psalm 151. This is significant because Psalm 151 is also quoted by the Apostles in their Apostolic Constitutions as a, tr as a psalm truly from David. This Psalm 151 is included in the manuscripts of the Septuagint, which is the authority of the entire Church, except Catholics and Protestants. Therefore, on the shoulders of the more righteous churches of Christianity, who accepted Psalm 151 as part of the canon, and on the authority of the apostles themselves and their apostolic constitutions, 
It is evident that the original version of the Book of Psalms was indeed that of the Great Psalm Scroll, since they endorsed Psalm 151 as scripture, and Psalm 151 endorses the Great Psalm Scroll as the genuine Psalter authored by David. There is another amazing piece of information which confirms the Great Psalm Scroll as the original version. Four extra Psalms of David in the past were first included as part of the Book of Psalms in some manuscripts of the Syriac version of the Book of Psalms about a thousand years ago. In addition to Psalm 151, the Peshitta version has included for its congregations at times what it labels as Psalms 152 to 155. These Psalms, like Psalm 151, are also classified as outside of the numbers, so this version in the Syriac Bibles, too, is clearly secondary. Now, the fact that the Syrian Orthodox Church considered it canonical should be a strong indication that we ought to consider it canonical. The Syrian Orthodox Church did not just accept anything in Scripture, but only what they were truly convinced was of the Spirit. The fact that they considered Psalms 152 to 155 as deserving an inclusion in the Book of Psalms indicates that they considered those Psalms scriptural and as originally being part of the Book of Psalms. But it is a mystery to many as to how it could be possible that the Syrian Orthodox Church had access to these four extra Psalms. The answer is found in the first discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which occurred long before the modern discovery. The following is a quotation from a letter written about a thousand years ago by the Patriarch of the Syrian Orthodox Church at the time. It proves the origin of Psalms 152 to 155 are from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so the letter reads, We have learned from trustworthy Jews who had been instructed as catechumens into Christianity that ten years ago in the region of Jericho, books had been found in a cave. It happened that the dog of a hunting Arab that was following an animal entered a cave and did not come out. Its owner found, uh, followed it and found in the cliff a little room containing many books. The hunter went to Jerusalem and informed the Jews. They came en masse and found the books of the Old Testament and others in Hebraic writing. And since the narrator was knowledgeable about writing and was learned, I asked him about the many passages in our New Testament that seem to be derived from the Old, but nothing is found there either by us Christians nor by the Jews. He said they exist and are present in the books discovered there. Since I heard this from that catechumen and also asked the other se- separately and discovered the same story without difference, I wrote about it to the noble Gabriel and to the Subhalamuran, the Metropolitan of Damascus, that they might search in those books and see whether there occurs anywhere in the prophets, passages that are introduced into the New Testament from the Old, but are not present in the text that we possess. I also bid them, if they were to find the following words in those books, to transmit them to me in any event. It reads in the psalm that starts, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your grace. Sprinkle on me with the hyssop of the blood of your cross, and purify me. This saying is not found in the Septuagint, nor in the other translations, nor in the Hebrew. But that Hebrew said to me, We found in those books more than 200 psalms of David. Now I am writing about that in addition. I think, nevertheless, that these books have been left behind by the prophet Jeremiah or Baruch or some other of those who heard the word of God and were moved by it, as the prophets in divine revelations revealed the conquest, plundering, and destruction that would come upon the people because of their sins. They concealed there, being absolutely convinced that none of the words of God should be lost, the writings in cliffs and caves, and deposited those so that they would not be burned with fire or stolen by the plunderers. But having hidden them, they died in the course of seventy years or less, and as the people returned from Babylon, none of them were left who deposited the books. Thus Ezra and the others were forced to seek and discover what the Hebrew contains. The present text in the Hebrew consists of three parts. From one part, the seventy translators later translated that for the famous king Ptolemy. From the second part, some others later translated. The third is that which among them was protected and kept, or untranslated. When these passages are found in the aforementioned books, it is clear that they are as reliable as those used by the Hebrews and by us. But I have not received any answer from him in response to my inquiry. But I don't have a suitable person whom I can send. It is in my heart like fire. In my bones it burns and glows. This letter is extremely significant. The parallels with the discovery of modern times of the Dead Sea Scrolls is unbelievable. The following is a quotation of a summary written by scholars of the modern discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the spring of 1947, Bedouin goat herds searching the cliffs among the Dead Sea for a lost goat came upon a cave containing jars filled with manuscripts. That find caused a sensation when it was released to the world and continues to fascinate the scholarly community and the public to this day. The first discoveries came to the attention of scholars in 1948 when seven of the scrolls were sold by the Bedouin to a cobbler and antiquities dealer called Kando. He in turn sold three of the scrolls to Eliezer al-Sukenik of Hebrew University, 
and four to Metropolitan Mar Athanasius Yeshua Samuel of the Syrian Orthodox Monastery of St. Mark. Mar Athanasius in turn brought his four to the American School of Oriental Research, where they came to the attention of American and European scholars. It was not until 1949 that the site of the find was identified as the cave now known as Qumran Cave 1. It was that identification that led to further explorations and excavations of the area of Kerbet Qumran. Further search of Cave 1 revealed archaeological finds of pottery, cloth, and wood, as well as a number of additional manuscript fragments. It was these discoveries that proved decisively that the scrolls were indeed ancient and authentic. Between 1949 and 1956, in what became a race between the Bedouin and the archaeologists, ten additional caves were found in the hills around Qumran. Caves that yielded several more scrolls, as well as thousands of fragments of scrolls, the remnants of approximately 800 manuscripts dating from approximately 200 BC to 68 CE. The manuscripts of the Qumran caves include early copies of biblical books in Hebrew and Aramaic, hymns, prayers, Jewish writings known as pseudepigrapha, because they are attributed to ancient biblical characters such as Enoch or the prophets, or excuse me, or the patriarchs, and texts that seem to represent the beliefs of a particular Jewish group that may have lived at the site of Qumran. So the correspondence between the two short stories couldn't be more striking. In both accounts, an Arab Bedouin is searching after an animal that went astray. In both accounts, the animal le leads the Arab Bedouin to the caves where the manuscripts are. In both accounts, the Arab Bedouin informs the Jews and scholars in both travel en masse to the site. In both accounts, the books were found in the same general vicinity, near Jericho in the Dead Sea region. In both accounts, high leaders in the Syrian Orthodox Church are involved and greatly interested in the find and seek to get access to the books found. In both, many apocryphal books as well as biblical books were found. In both, more than 200 psalms attributed to David were found. In both are additional writings found in Hebrew writing, and in both are the writings reflective of scriptures and readings of scripture which correspond greater with quotations of scripture in the New Testament and the Septuagint. Now, if these facts laid out, what are the odds that the Syrian Orthodox Church, which was the main group a thousand years ago invested in the first discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, are the only group of Christians to have Psalms 152 to 155 in their Bibles, and that the only other testimony to these texts existing are in the modern find of the Dead Sea Scrolls? To me, it's nearly impossible to not identify the source of Psalms 152 to 155 in the Syriac the Shida version of the Biblical Book of Psalms as coming from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Thus, the fact that the Syrian Orthodox Church endorsed these four additional Psalms as authentic and included them as part of the Book of Psalms indicates that they were included as part of the Book of Psalms in the Dead Sea Scrolls that they found, and therefore are scriptural on the authority of the judgment of the Syrian Orthodox Church. It is also unlikely to think that someone would have dared to corrupt the original Book of Psalms by adding additional Psalms into the text. Jews were much more respectful, uh, respectful of the scriptures than is alleged by people. No Jew would have done such a thing to add what they knew to be false into the book of Psalms with no indication of its falsehood. Thus we see, for example, in the, in the Septuagint, the clarifier that Psalm 151 is not in the official counting of the standard book of Psalms. Yet we see no clarifier in the Great Psalm Scroll, indicating that such extra Psalms contained the Great Psalm Scroll and attributed to, the, attributed to David are highly improbable to have been composed by forgers or editors, for if they had done so, they would have been viewed as grossly sinful in the eyes of the Jews. If the evidence has proven that the Great Psalm Scroll is in fact the original, now the question becomes, why were the 14 extra Psalms removed from the original Book of Psalms? At least some of the Psalms which were removed are very easy to see why the scribes would want to remove them. Thus, the Psalm describing the Psalms of David were removed because they were not viewed as an actual Psalm, and they contradicted the Oral Law of the Pharisees, the Biblical Canon of the Pharisees, and they contradicted the liturgical worship of the Pharisees. The last two psalms, equivalent to Psalm 151 of the Septuagint version, were removed because they seemed more like a prose account rather than a psalm, and had little to do with worship of Yahuwah, but were more so a glorification and autobiographical account of David's life and his war victories. Similar to when the people praised David when saying, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. This is not a glorification and praise of Yahuwah, but rather it is a glorification and praise of King David. So they removed the last two psalms because they were a glorification and praise of David and not Yahuwah. The Song of Wisdom, found in the Wisdom of Sirach as well, was removed from the Book of Psalms because of its highly erotic content. The Jews would not have wanted this song being read in their congregations and were embarrassed by its composition. If one objects and points to the Song of Solomon, it should be pointed out that for this very reason, some of the Jews in ancient times argued strongly for Song of Solomon to not be considered scripture because of its overly erotic nature. But this was ultimately decided against, and they deemed that the book 
is to be used as scripture, but that it is not to be read in the congregations with children less than 13 years of age in their presence, so that the young ears would not be corrupted by the erotic content in the psalm. The last words of David is also similar to a testament of David rather than a psalm, and it was most likely removed since it was already found in the account of 2 Samuel. Psalms 152 to 154 are focused on David's encounter with the lion and the wolf, and it seems that the compiler of the book of Psalms found it unfit for a liturgical context due to the personal and historical nature of the Psalms in question, it being too Davidic in content to apply to people in the congregations. It is to be observed that both the memorial for Judah and the memorial for Zion were removed. This is because they do not glorify or address or praise Yahuwah, but they glorify and address and praise Judah and Zion. So the scribes removed it as unfitting in a liturgical context of worship of Yahuwah. The plea of de deliverance in Psalm 155 were probably removed because they were more of prayers rather than psalms. And the Pharisees wanted in their liturgical version of the book of Psalms only psalms which could be sung by the congregation as worship psalms. The hymns of the Creator is based on the creation account in the book of Jubilees, and for this reason it must have been removed by the Pharisees because they rejected the book of Jubilees. The Katina is easily explained as being removed for the sake of abbreviating Psalm 136. The motivation for abbreviating Psalm 136 is uncertain, but it seems that the Katina was considered overly repetitious. There is quite a lot of evidence in manuscripts of scripture of passages being removed due to them being considered overly repetitious. Several copies in the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Book of Psalms have some portions of the Book of Psalms in a rearranged order. This is a further indication that it was considered acceptable by Jews to make copies of the Psalms in rearranged order. This was mainly justified in that the Psalms were largely used in a liturgical manner. Rearranging them, thus, would be acceptable in that it would be rearranged for a community purpose. The arrangement found in the Great Psalm Scroll, however, is noticeably different than for a communal motivation, but it is clear that the order was intended to be accepted as canonical. This is confirmed by the fact that the majority of the copies of the Psalms and the Dead Sea Scrolls, when preserving the same passages, testify to the same order as that found in the Great Psalm Scroll. Other copies exhibit a rearrangement of the order of the Great Psalm Scroll into just a slightly different order, indicating they were working from the order of the Great Psalm Scroll as the main source of their rearrangement, and not the order of Psalms from the Masoretic text. All in total, at least... Seven, uh, at least 38 copies of the Book of Psalms were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, with the majority of them corroborating the order I have presented as the original version of the Book of Psalms, or having a rearranged order which agrees much closer with the order of the Great Psalm Scroll than the traditional order of the Masoretic Version. The following is a brief overview of the agreement or lack thereof of the Dead Sea Scrolls version numbering system with the Masoretic Version and Septuagint Version. Now, when I say Psalms such and such agree with this version, the Psalms that I'm mentioning are the Dead Sea Scrolls numbering. So, Psalms 1 to 9 agrees with both versions, Septuagint and Masoretic. Psalms 10 to 32 agree with the Masoretic only. Psalms 33 to 37 agree with the Septuagint only. Psalms 39 to 70 agree with the Masoretic only. Psalms 72 to 92 agree with the Masoretic only. Psalms 93 to 102 agree with the Septuagint only. Psalms 106 to 112 agree with the Masoretic only. Psalms 120 to 132 agree with the Masoretic only. Psalms 134 to 135 agree with the Septuagint only. Psalm 71 is exactly 40 in difference from the Septuagint numbering of the same psalm, Septuagint Psalm 31. For Psalms 103 to 15, Psalms 103 and 104 are exactly 10 in difference from the Masoretic numbering of the same psalms, Psalm 113 and Psalm 114. For Psalm 105, it is exactly 10 in difference from the Septuagint numbering, Septuagint Psalm 115. Psalm 116 is exactly 30 in difference from the numbering of the Septuagint version, which is numbered as 146 and 147. Psalms 152 to 153, in the Masoretic version, they are exactly 10 in difference, being numbered as 142 to 143. Psalm 159 differs exactly 20 in the numbering of the same psalm in the Septuagint with it being numbered in the Septuagint as 139. And Psalms 161 to 162 differs from the Septuagint numbering by exactly 10, the Septuagint numbering being Psalm 151. In summary, only 40 Psalms differ in number out of the 162 Psalms, with obviously 14 extra Psalms differing in numbering. Since the original version of the Book of Psalms counted the 150 Psalms as 148 Psalms, Subtracting 14 from the number 40, only 26 psalms of the Book of Psalms are in 
a different order and numbering scheme, making 122 sums out of 148 in the same exact order in the same exact place as they are in everyone's Bibles. The amazing correspondence of the Dead Sea Scrolls version numbering system to both the Masoretic version's numbering system and the Septuagint version's numbering system is a strong indication that these two versions are secondary and both derive from the common source that is the Dead Sea Scrolls version that I have presented today. The fact that the, dead, uh, the, fact that the Great Psalms scroll was found in the same cave that the Temple scroll was found also is strong evidence that the Great Psalms scroll is the original version of the Book of Psalms. For if, as I proved in the other presentation I did, that the Temple scroll is the original version of the Book of Deuteronomy, the Great Psalms scroll being in the same library and treasured and preserved by the same people who treasured and preserved for us the original book of Deuteronomy, and found in the same exact cave, then this proves that the great psalm scroll is the original version of the book of Psalms. For if they preserved for us the original book of the law, we can also trust that they preserved for us the original book of the Psalms of David in the same cave. I believe I have argued quite convincingly that the original version of the book of Psalms is none other than that found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the great psalm scroll. And there were 14 extra psalms found in the original version of the book of Psalms, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls. These psalms are as follows. Memorial for Judah, Katina, Psalm 152, Psalm 154, Plea of Deliverance, Psalm 153, Sirach, chapter 30, uh, excuse me, chapter 50, verses 13 to 30, Memorial for Zion, Psalm 155, Hymn to the Creator, Last Words of David, which is 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 7, um, Composition of David, Psalm 151a, and Psalm 151b. These extra psalms have all been published so I am not going to read them in this presentation. If you would like to hear them read, you can listen to the longer presentation I did, or you can find translations of them available online. I have also provided versions of all 14 psalms in my version of the Book of Psalms that I did. Um, and also, when I said Sirach, uh, it's Sirach chapter 51, verses 13 to 30. So, sorry about the, the error there. But so... I'm not going to be reading those 14 psalms, but however, I will be reading through the hymn to the Creator and the compositions of David and discussing the implications of those two extra psalms. The hymn to the Creator reads, And Alleluia! Great and holy is Yahuwah, the holiest of the holy ones from generation to generation. Glory precedes him, and following him is the rush of many waters. Grace and truth surround his presence. Truth and justice and righteousness are, are the foundation of his throne. Separating light from deep darkness... He established the dawn by the knowledge of his heart. When all his angels had seen this, they sang aloud, for he showed them what they had not known. He crowns the hills with fruit, perfect food for every living being. Blessed be he who has made the earth by his power, who has established the world in his wisdom. In his understanding he spread out the heaven and brought forth the wind from his storehouses. He made clouds for the rain and caused mists to rise from the end of the earth. This psalm is very significant because if this psalm was truly written by David, it proves the book of Jubilees is scripture, since this psalm quotes the book of Jubilees. Verses 4 to 5 of this psalm again read, Separating light from deep darkness, he established the dawn by the knowledge of his heart. When all his angels had seen this, they sang aloud, for he showed them what they had not known. Compare this to what we see in Jubilees chapter 2. He created the abysses in the darkness, even tide and the light, dawn and day, which he hath prepared in the knowledge of his heart. And thereupon we saw his works, and praised him, and lauded before him on account of all his works, for seven great works that he created on the first day. The parallels are striking. Both are accounts of creation, both mention the creation of deep darkness separated from light, and both in the same exact words that he established the dawn in the knowledge of his heart. Immediately after these words, verse 5 of the psalm tells us that the angels, when they had seen these things created, praised Yahuwah. The same exact thing is said in the book of Jubilees immediately after we are told that the dawn was created in the knowledge of his heart. The angels tell us in their own words that they that when they saw what he created, they praised Yahuwah. So because the two accounts are clearly related to one another, this means that one of them was quoting the other. The author of the book of Jubilees would not have quoted the book of Psalms, for this would have been considered an anachronism on the part of the author of Jubilees. And the author of Jubilees sought to avoid such anachronisms. The psalm is also a very premature account of the creation, whereas the account in Jubilees is full and complete. The evidence thus makes the most sense that this psalm is quoting the book of Jubilees as an authoritative source. If then the great psalm scroll is the original version of the book of Psalms, this proves the book of Jubilees is scripture. Now the compositions of David reads as follows. And David son of Jesse 
was wise and a, and a light like the light of the sun, and a scribe and discerning and perfect in all his ways before God and men. And Yahuwah gave him a discerning and enlightened spirit. And he wrote 3,600 psalms and songs to sing before the altar over the whole burnt offering for every day, and for all the days of the year, 364. And for the Sabbath offerings, 52 songs. And for the offering of the Hodeshim, and for all the days of the festivals, and for the Day of Atonement, 30 songs. And all the songs that he uttered were 446, and songs for making music over the possessed, 4. And the total was 4,050. All these he uttered through prophecy, which had been given to him before, which had been given him before the Most High. So this was found, this piece was found in the Great Psalm School as part of the scriptural text. Now to deal with this psalm, which scholars call the composition of David, this psalm is the most important portion of the Great Psalm School. If the Great Psalm School is scripture, this psalm is scripture. And if it is scripture, this psalm single-handedly demolishes and crushes the teaching of, teachings of the Pharisees. The standardization of scripture that the scribes of the Pharisees did allowed the Pharisees to have control not only of Israel's interpretation of the Law of Moses and Israel's interpretation of the prophets, but also allow them to have control over Israel's worship services and the liturgy of Israel's synagogues. In other words, the Pharisees won control over the entire religion of all of Israel. They wanted to impose their man-made traditions onto the people. What we see is that the Great Psalm Scroll and the Dead Sea Scrolls is not only in opposition to the liturgical monopoly of the Pharisees over Israel's synagogue worship, but it is also in opposition to the oral laws of the Pharisees, and it is in opposition to the Pharisees' biblical canon of the prophets. The Great Psalm Scroll opposes the oral law of the Pharisees because the Great Psalm Scroll explicitly endorses the solar calendar as the one and only true calendar that is to be used for the observation of the holy festivals and Sabbaths. This is clear because this psalm says that David composed 364 songs for all the days of the year, and 52 songs for all the Sabbaths of the year, and 30 songs for all the festivals of the year. This is describing the solar calendar that Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, and the Dead Sea Scrolls teaches. Whereas the Pharisees taught that all the days of the year are 354 days, not 364. And they taught all the Sabbaths of the year are 50 or 51, not 52. And they taught that all the festivals of the year were 18 and not 30. The Pharisees followed a lunar calendar which completely contradicts the solar calendar of 364 days that Genesis, Enoch, Jubilees, the Great Psalm Scroll, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Revelation of John endorse. This psalm in the Great Psalm Scroll also opposes the biblical canon of the prophets that the Pharisees had because it explicitly identifies 4,050 songs of David as divinely inspired prophetic scripture. We also saw earlier the evidence that the Great Psalm Scroll endorsed the Book of Jubilees as scripture. All these extra writings completely contradict the Pharisees because the Pharisees did not accept these writings as scripture. So if the Great Psalm Scroll is the original version of the Book of Psalms, it proves the oral law of the Pharisees is full of false teaching. It proves the solar calendar of 364 days is the true calendar, and it proves that the Pharisees are wrong about what is and is not scripture, and that all 4,050 songs are of David are scripture, and that the Book of Jubilees is scripture. The psalm also specifies that 4,050 songs are to be used for liturgical worship, and when and for what purpose they are to be used, and this specification contradicts the much narrower liturgical worship that the Pharisees established for themselves. Do you find it difficult to believe that David wrote 4,050 songs? You might think so, and yet 1 Kings chapter 4 has a passage that reads almost exactly like this psalm in the Great Psalm Scroll. 1 Kings 4 reads, And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezrahite, and Heman, Chalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Also he spoke of trees, from the cedar tree of Lebanon even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of the fish. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Comparing the two, we see a striking similarity of language. And David, son of, uh, this is from the Great Psalm School. And David, son of Jesse, was wise and a light like the light of the sun, and a scribe and discerning and perfect in all his ways before God and men. And Yahuwah gave him a discerning and enlightened spirit. And he wrote 3,600 psalms. And then the rest of it, it gives all the other psalms that David wrote. And this is what 1 Kings 4 said. Again, And God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Thus, Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men. 
and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. So notice that they both say that David and Solomon were wise in the sight of God and considered wiser than all men. They both say that God gave them great wisdom, and they both say immediately after how many songs and other compositions that they wrote. The similarity of language proves that this psalm in the great psalm scroll of David's songs is just as much authoritative and authentic as this notice in 1 Kings of Solomon's songs. Also consider that 1 Kings says that Solomon wrote 1,005 songs. Well, guess what? There is only one of those 1,005 songs of Solomon in the Bible, and that song is about sex. What happened to the other 1,004 songs that Solomon composed? It is clear that the Pharisees' version of the Bible with one song and that they picked the one that was about sex, proves that their Bible is not true, and that many other writings were left out by them because they didn't like what the other writings said. For if they had liked them, they would have included them in their Bibles. So we see that out of 1,005 songs, the Pharisees removed all of those songs except for one. They removed and hid from us and destroyed 1,004 songs. So it is not inconceivable that David wrote 4,050 songs, and that most of them were removed from the Bibles of the Pharisees. It is also impossible to believe that Solomon wrote more songs than David, considering it was David and not Solomon that was considered the chief psalmist and musician of Yahuwah in the Bible. So this means that by this alone, David must have written well over 1,000 songs. A handful of these many other songs that David wrote were also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but unfortunately most of the songs are still lost. These other songs, such as the songs for the Sabbath Sacrifice and the Thanksgiving Psalms, were written by David, but were not part of the original book of Psalms, but were part of the other book of books of psalms that David wrote. The fact that David wrote other psalms not in our Bibles is proven by other parts of the Old Testament in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Chronicles, which quote entire psalms of David which are not in our copies of the book of psalms. And now at the very end of the Great Psalm School, we see this psalm. An Alleluia of David, song, uh, son of Jesse, I was small among my brethren, and youngest of my father's sons, and he made me shepherd of his flock and ruler over his kid goats. My hands formed a musical instrument, and my fingers tuned a psaltery, and I gave glory to Yahuwah. I said to myself, The mountains do not witness to me, nor do the hills proclaim, the trees my words, and the flock my deeds. Who then shall announce, and who will speak, and who, will, who shall account, recount my deeds? The Lord of all, the God of all, he hears and he listens. He sent forth his prophet, Samuel, to anoint me, to make me great. My brothers went out to meet him, handsome of figure and appearance. Although they were tall of stature and handsome by their hair, Yahuwah God did not take pleasure in them, but he sent and took me from behind the flock, and he anointed me with the holy oil, and he made me leader of his people and ruler over the sons of his covenant. And the next psalm, beginning of David's power after God's prophet had anointed him. And I saw a Philistine threatening from the ranks of the Philistines. I went forth to meet the Philistine, and he cursed me by his idols. I looked up, lifted my eyes to the height, and saw the holy ones opposing the Philistine. And there was good pleasure from before Yahuwah, and I smote the Philistine on his forehead, to make peace dwell by his agency in the border of Israel. And immediately the splendor of his face changed, and his knees knocked together, and his sword fell, and the shaft of his lance was shattered. And I drew his own sword and beheaded him, and removed reproach from the children of Israel. Now, in the Septuagint, it has this same so these, these two same songs, but as one psalm, and it shortens and condenses, condenses the material significantly. So the following words are not in ours. An Alleluia, son of Jesse, his flock and ruler over his, uh, he made me. And I gave glory to Yahuwah. I said to myself, the mountains do not witness to me, nor do the hills proclaim. The trees my words and the flock my deeds. And who will speak and who will, shall recount my deeds? Of all, the God of all. And he listens. Prophet Samuel to anoint me to make me great, went out to meet him, of figure and appearance, although they were of stature and handsome by their hair, but he sent behind, he made me leader of his people and ruler over the sons of his covenant, beginning of David's power after God's prophet had anointed him, and I saw a Philistine threatening from the ranks of the Philistines, and then the majority of the rest of that is not in in the Septuagint version. So we see here clear marks of abbreviation in a Septuagint version. When you read the Septuagint version of Psalm 151, it is much shorter and has these extra details removed. 
all of this evidence, I believe, proves conclusively that the Great Psalm Scroll is in fact the original version of the Book of Psalms. One thing to note, this presentation is actually a shortened version of the original presentation that I have recorded for the conveniency of listeners. What is very compelling to even more support my, my views is that people who listened to the longer version had a very hard time following along because it was so long. It was about two hours the length of the seminar presentation, over two hours long. And so one can see that people, when they were listening to that very long version, tuned out and kind of wanted to ignore what was being said. In a similar way, you can see how the scribes copying the scripture, when they were copying really redundant and repetitive passages of scripture, you see, these, these scribes had to read these passages of scripture hours on end every day, and they got tired of it. It was very tiresome, repetitive material. And so one can see a clear, one can at least understand the motiva motivation of the scribes to condense the material that they were copying, to make it easier for themselves, because they like to cut corners and be lazy. And so the fact that people have a hard time listening to a long presentation that's like two hours just shows and makes much more likely my claim that the scribes did this very thing to the Book of Psalms because the Book of Psalms in the original version was very uh, was much longer and uh, fuller. So it, for them, it was the scribes copying it. They often felt it was tedious, a tedious job to copy the, this material. So they shortened it for the sake of convenience of themselves and their uh, their listeners who were participating in reading the books. So. Anyways, that's one interesting thing that I wanted to say about that. So, I hope you stay tuned to future presentations that I'll do, and I will do my best to keep them a shortened amount of time, between one hour and an hour and 20 minutes. I will try to keep it within that a lot of time. Shalom, and I hope you are blessed by the work that I have been doing for you all.